I'm Sarah Foyer. I'm the Rosenblum Family Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. In December of 2020, in the waning days of the Trump administration, the White House announced that America would formally recognize Moroccan sovereignty over a territory called the Western Sahara. And in parallel, Morocco would be resuming diplomatic relations with Israel. Now, the normalization between Morocco and Israel understandably got a lot of attention at the time. But the decision about the Western Sahara was also significant. It's just that many Americans may not be aware of the territory's history or have been following the longstanding conflict there. So what's been happening in this strip of land and what are America's interests there? Here's a quick historical recap. The roots of the Western Sahara conflict date to the establishment of the Spanish colony in the Sahara in 1884. Prior to the Spanish arrival, the area was largely populated by Berber tribes, that is to say tribes of the main ethnic group which had populated North Africa since even before the arrival of Arabs in the 7th century. In 1956, Morocco, which was then under the leadership of King Mohammed V, gained independence from the French. And in one of his first acts as king, Mohammed asserted what was by then a centuries-old claim to the Sahara as part of the Moroccan kingdom. And there is something to these claims. If you look at old maps of the territory over which the Alawite dynasty of Muhammad V's ancestors had extended its rule since roughly the 17th century, you can see that much of the Sahara was included therein. Now, Muhammad V died in 1961, and his son, Hassan II, ascended the throne. But he struggled to gain legitimacy in the way that his father had enjoyed it. That lack of legitimacy partly explained the decision in 1975 to launch what became known as the Green March. This was essentially a resettling of 350,000 Moroccans in the territory of the Sahara. Hassan's decision to launch the Green March came in the wake of two main developments. The first was Spain's announcement that it would be withdrawing from the territory. Remember, this was in the heady days of anti-colonial struggles around the world. And second, it came two years after the establishment of a group calling itself the Polisario Front and claiming to represent the indigenous people of the Sahara, or the Sahrawis. The International Court of Justice was asked to weigh in on the status of the territory prior to the Spanish colonization in 1884. The ICJ expressed the opinion that the materials and information presented to it showed the existence, at the time of Spanish colonization, of legal ties of allegiance between the Sultan of Morocco and some of the Berber tribes living in the territory of Western Sahara. But on the other hand, the court said that there had not been any tie of territorial sovereignty between the Sahara and Morocco, and therefore the territory should be decolonized and governed according to the principle of self-determination. So it was a bit of a mixed bag. Hassan nonetheless proceeded with his plans to settle several hundred thousand Moroccans in the territory, and the decision prompted the Polisario to launch attacks against Moroccan troops. This began what would turn out to be a 16-year war between Morocco and the Polisario, with the latter receiving substantial military and financial assistance from neighboring Algeria, which also set up refugee camps to house several thousand Sahrawi refugees who fled beginning in 1975. A year later, the Polisario declared the Saharan Arab Democratic Republic, with a government in exile in Algeria. That entity didn't receive formal recognition from the UN, but it did gain limited recognition of a number of states, including Algeria. Thereafter, Morocco began gradually annexing the territory, building a defensive wall, or really a sand berm, with access paths for Moroccan troops. It's important to keep in mind that the Sahara is attractive to Morocco not just for historical reasons, but also for the access the territory provides to phosphates, precious metals, and fishing along the coast. Morocco and the Polisario, with Algeria's help, remained at war until a ceasefire was brokered by the UN in 1991, by which point somewhere between 14 and 20,000 people had been killed on both sides, and Morocco had annexed 80% of the territory. In 1991, the UN ceasefire called for a referendum to determine whether the Sahrawi would opt for independence or integration into Morocco. 
The accord also installed a peacekeeping force known as the UN Mission for the Referendum in Western Sahara, or MINURSO, along a buffer zone between Moroccan-controlled Western Sahara on the one hand and neighboring Algeria and Mauritania on the other. The original rationale behind the creation of MINURSO was to bolster the ceasefire while the parties could lay the groundwork for a referendum, in which the Sahrawi would presumably choose between independence and integration into Morocco. That referendum has yet to take place due to a number of obstacles, including disagreement over whether full-scale independence should be offered as a ballot option, a lack of consensus on eligibility requirements for voter participation, and occasional eruptions of violence. So from the late 1990s to the mid-2000s, Morocco and the Polisario held various unsuccessful rounds of negotiations, some of which were brokered by the United States and others conducted under UN auspices. Then, in 2007, Rabat proposed a plan to grant Western Sahara autonomy under Moroccan sovereignty. The United States deemed that proposal, quote, serious, realistic, and credible, end quote. And France agreed, but the Polisario and Algeria rejected it. In the ensuing decade and a half, roughly, with the conflict largely frozen in place, the UN continued to renew the mandate of MINURSO, likely recognizing that the peacekeeping force was contributing to a relative stability in the region. So this was the situation up to last December, when President Trump announced that the U.S. would be formally recognizing Moroccan sovereignty over the territory. Now, thus far, the Biden administration has upheld the decision, while also voicing its support for a political resolution to the crisis and calling for the appointment of a new UN envoy for the Sahara. This is a post that has remained vacant for nearly two years. This is a prudent approach, and it echoes the recommendations we recently outlined in a Washington Institute presidential transition study. That is to say, upholding the previous administration's decision and thus maintaining American credibility and preserving Moroccan-Israeli normalization, which serves clear U.S. interests, while also supporting ongoing negotiations toward an eventual resolution to the conflict. Today, the population of Western Sahara stands at around 650,000, a mix of Sahrawis and Moroccans who have settled there since 1975. Meanwhile, on the other side of the berm, the UN estimates that 174,000 Sahrawis currently live in the Tindouf refugee camps, of whom around 90,000 have been classed as the most vulnerable. Any political settlement regarding the Sahara will need to take into account the situation of these refugees, and both Morocco and the Polisario have come under criticism for their handling of human rights in their respective territories. There are also reports suggesting that a number of U.S.-designated terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda and Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, have developed ties to the Polisario and infiltrated the camps to varying degrees, exploiting poor conditions and a lack of governance on the ground to extend their influence. Needless to say, preventing the people and territories of Northwest Africa from being used by extremist groups for terrorist operations, transit, recruitment, and financing remains a key U.S. interest. More generally, the Western Sahara represents one of those long-simmering conflicts which could erupt at any moment and disturb what has otherwise remained a relatively stable region of the Arab world, a rarity that Washington has an interest in preserving.